I said, what we are going to do way back in the Bible days, Noah told the people that it's going to rain when he told them they paid him no mind. And when the rains came, they were left behind. I'm going to, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. You better get ready and bear this in mind. God showed Noah the rainbow signs. He said it won't be water, but fire next time. I said, when after the rains came, they began to pour. They knocked on the windows. You know that they knocked on the doors. That then the people, they didn't know exactly what to do. <laughs> you don't know what this is happening to you. I don't like All that right, text. Joe. Way back in the Bible days, Noah told the people that it's going to rain. When he told them, they paid him no mind. Then when it happened, they were left behind. You know they knocked on the window. They knocked on the door. But no one said, I'm sorry, my friend. God's got the keys and you can't get in. If something don't happen to the hearts of men, the same thing is going to happen again. I'm saying it's going to rain. Do you believe it's going to rain? You better get ready and better get right. God so no show him the rainbow shine. He said it won't be water, but fire next time. Yes. Praise the Lord. I had a backup singer. Hallelujah. But you know, it's Sister Edmund's fault. She reminded me uh, a week ago or two weeks ago that I, I sang a song one time. So you could blame her. Praise the Lord. I had a little flashback there for a moment. Psalm 77 verse 13 says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is a greater God as he? John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Steve Harvey said it better than I can. Introducing the king of kings, his way. He said something like this, saints of the living God, it is my honor. I said it's my honor to introduce a man who needs no introduction, who, who needs no introduction. His blessings are too long to list. Hallelujah. He has done the impossible time and time again. He hails out of a manger in Bethlehem, Jerusalem, by a way of heaven. He was born a virgin. His daddy is, I'm sorry, he was born of a virgin. <laughs> His daddy is the author and bestseller of the best book that has ever been sold. He holds the record for the, the world's greatest fish fry, Pastor. Uh, he fed 5,000, five loaves of bread. He can walk on water, turn water into wine, no special effects and no camera tricks. He is still the heir, the king of kings and lord of lords, a ruler of the universe. He's the Alpha 
and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the bright and morning star. Some say he's a rose of Sharon, and some say he's a prince of peace. Get on your feet. I say, get on your feet. Get on your feet and show your love for the love. He's about to come. He's about to break through. And he's the only Jesus. He's the only one. And his name is Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Yesterday, about 5.50 a.m., I was just doing my normal walk. There was no ice in front of me. I took four steps down into the lower level parking lot at Montefiore Hospital in Yonkers. And next thing I know, I was looking at the sky. Mm. Came down, twisted my knee and my ankle. Was sent to the hospital. I was at the hospital for four hours. Hallelujah, saying, Lord, I can't let the pastor down. You're going to have to perform a miracle. So I started praying. Then somebody came in the next room next to me. I started praying for that lady who couldn't breathe. I just had a knee problem and an ankle problem, but the old lady couldn't breathe. And I started praying for her and started praying for everybody in the emergency room. I give God praise that I'm here today. Yes. See, God has given me great experiences in dealing with knee problems. <laughs> I've had knee problems since I was young, playing basketball, playing high school football. But God has shown me how to get just myself ready for today. So I give him all the praise, honor, and glory. I might not look like it, but it's, it's a real knee injury. Praise the Lord. But God has done great things for me. Great things. I'd like to thank the pastor for allowing me to stand in his pulpit. Praise the Lord. My title today is Six Words That Tell the Story. Six Words That Tell the Story. And my subtitle is Form, Deform, Reform, Inform, Conform, and Transform. Is that all right? Let us pray. Father, we come before you. You've done it for me in the past, and I'm asking you to do it again. Hide me behind your cross. Don't let Joe Davis be shown, but we ask that your Holy Spirit will move and show yourself. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Holy Bible is the inspired word of God, penned by approximately 40 different writers over a period of approximately 15 1,600 years. The Bible contains 66 books. How many books? 39 of these books are called the Old Testament, and 26 of them make up the New Testament. Although these 66 inspired books uh, were written between 14 BC and 100 AD, the information in them cover a period from the beginning of time to the final judgment. The Bible covers subjects. It contains many parables and uh, profound lessons. It deals with a host of ideas and concepts, and it looks into the private lives. I said it looks into the private lives of many kings and queens and prophets. Oh, I'm going there today. But despite the diversity in the Bible, and notwithstanding the wide range of subjects which it covers, the Bible has one central theme, which is this. Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. I'll repeat that. Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. He took on humanity. I said he took on human flesh and came into a sin-cursed world. He was crucified on a Roman's cross. He was buried in a borrowed grave but he arose on the third day. Hallelujah. And if we can believe in him and accept him as our personal savior, we will not only escape the fire and brimstone, we will receive the gift of salvation and spend eternity in heaven with God and with his angels. 
Hallelujah. Yes, that is the central theme of the Bible. Now, there are six words that tell the whole story, and the first word is form. What word did I say? Formed. When God made the universe and the Holy Spirit laid the cornerstones, he didn't tell us where he laid it. Consequently, we are told this earth is over 6,000 years old. Now, it seems that one of God's plans for from the very beginning was to make human beings. Now, that's us. <laughs> but he wanted to get everything in perfect readiness before he brought man on the scene. So before God made man, he built a luxurious house in which man would dwell. It was a palatial home. I said it was a palatial home. <laughs> a palatial home with the earth as the floor and the sky as the roof. To solve the problem of continual darkness, God said, let there be light. And as soon as he said it, it was done. And man's home had light. God saw that the mansions was flat, and he decided a multi-level abode. So he remedied the situation by using his powerful hands to scoop out the valleys and pile them up as mountains. Then to add color to his creation, God simply said, bring forth. And instantaneously, a great variety of plants shot up from the ground. Giant oaks and redwoods and weeping willows bowed before him. Daffodils and rosebuds along with lush green carpets. To give atmosphere to his creation and give man something to wonder about, God installed indirect lighting in his house. He created a huge ball of fire and he called it sun. And he threw it into orbit and assigned it to work the day shift. Yes, he did. Then he made a smaller light, called it the moon, hallelujah, hurled it into orbit and assigned it to work the night shift. Then to really beautify the mansion, God made millions of stars and ordered them to twinkle to his glory and honor when the moon reported for duty. Yes, he did. God installed backyard swimming pools. He spat out the seven seas and and to demonstrate and to distribute the waters throughout his creation, God just tilted the earth. Yes, he did. Until the water was well distributed throughout this world, creating lakes and streams. As God looked at his house, I say God looked at his house that he was building for man, he saw that just about everything was ready. The carpet was installed. I said the carpet was installed, the lighting fixtures were in place, and the house was well heated with solar energy. But God decided that the backyard aquarium needed some fish. He just said, bring forth, and giant whales, and sharks, and bass, and small fish, and goldfish, and tadpoles begin to swim in the waters. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. One body of water got, this is amazing. One body of water, God took a salt shaker and just shook some salt. Seasoned salt, hallelujah, on this body of water. And the other body of water, he just left it alone. Then God decided that man would need some pets to keep him company and teach him a sense of responsibility so God said, bring forth. And just like that, elephants and giraffes and horses and, and other animals of every assortment began to roam the earth, in the forest and in the land. Then to put the finishing touch on, on the mansion, hallelujah, God decided that man would need some piped in music. So he called the Bridgeport Tabernacle Pray, I mean, Yes, God decided he needed some piped-in music. So without hesitation, God looked up and said, bring forth. And before he could close his mouth, birds of every description 
I said birds of every description began to fly through the air, singing an impromptu symphony without a single rehearsal, Pastor. Mm. Now, everything was ready for man to be brought on the scene. With a wave of his hand, God stooped down and formed man. Out of the dust of the ground blew breath of life into his nostrils, and man became a living soul. A living soul. God saw that it was not good for man to live alone. So he put Adam to sleep. I said he put him to sleep without the benefits of anesthesia. And took a rib from Adam and Eve and formed Eve, his wife. We were created with a sense of pride and humility. Pride because we were formed by the hand of God. Hallelujah. Humility because we are made from the dust of the ground. Oh, I'm going there today. That's why it never ceases to amaze me. It never ceases to amaze me when I see one pile of dust refusing to speak to another pile of dust. Mm. We have divided ourselves by positions, degrees, titles, and economic status, but we're all formed by the dust of the ground. Dr. Dust, President Dust, Sister Dust, MBA Dust, Brother Dust, Sister Dust, Deacon Dust, Treasurer Dust, Pastor Dust, just dust formed by the Creator of God. The word to form implies an act of molding and fashioning into a form corresponding in design appearance to the divine plan. The word is used to describe the activities of a potter. You can find it in Isaiah 29, verse 16, and 49, verse 5, of the goldsmiths fashioning idols. Isaiah 44, and verse 9, Habakkuk 2, verse 18, and of God who fashions various things, among others, the light. Isaiah 45, verse 7. Oh, we serve a powerful God. The human eye, Psalms 94, verse 9. The heart, Psalms 33, verse 15. And the seasons of the year, Psalms 74, verse 17. See, man is composed of materials derived from the ground. The elements of the earth is conformed by science. Decomposition of the human body after death bears witness of this fact. The major elements making up the human body are oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Many others exist in similar portions. How true that man was made of the dust of the ground, and also that he shall return to the earth whence he has been come from. So God formed man, and this launches the story of the Bible. Now, here comes the second word. Are you ready? When God formed us, even though the substances from which he formed us uh, was elements, we were nonetheless perfect beings. Hallelujah. We were perfect physically. We were perfect mentally. We were perfect emotionally. And we were perfect spiritually. There were no blemishes whatsoever. In fact, Adam didn't even have to use the bathroom. You'll get that tomorrow. Adam and Eve were a beautiful couple. There was nothing ugly about them. In fact, the adjective ugly was not even in existence until sin entered into the picture. Well, well, well. When Satan, who was already moving to and fro, seeking who he might devour, saw how perfectly God had formed Adam and Eve. He was jealous. Satan set out. I said, Satan set out. Satan set out to deform them with his unrighteousness. Deforming people has always been Satan's specialty. That's what Satan is all about. He's always trying to deform what God has formed. Look at what is happening in America. Police killing young black men. Deformed. 
Look how easy it was for Satan to have us in America hate each other because of the color of our skins. Deformed. They say that hate crimes increased when Trump got in by 35% after the election. Deformed. There are hate crimes in the church of God. I said there are hate crimes in the church of God. I experienced it myself. Church members not speaking to one another just because deformed. It didn't take long to deform what God has formed. And Adam and Eve became outcasts, separated from their creator. They lost their palatial mansion, they re the relationship with their father, their health. They lost their health and eventually their lives. And Satan is still doing what he do, does the best. When God forms a spirit of brotherly love between members of the congregation and they're working together in perfect harmony, watch out. I said, watch out. Oh, Satan will get into somebody and before you know it, those loving members will be at each other's throats. Satan never lets up. He's always trying to deform what God has formed. I say he's always trying to deform what God has formed. The devil is still deforming some of us even right now. Deforming us with darts of gossip. Deforming us with darts of doubt. Deforming us with alcohol. Deforming us with smoking. Deforming us with sex outside of marriage. Deforming us with darts of lack of love. Lack of dedication for God's work. It's like cancer, you know. You say something negative and it spreads all through the church, deforming folk. Folk are so sensitive these days. When you're so thin-skinned, you can uh, be controlled by Satan. Deforming you, can, uh, deforming you when God had already formed you. Lord have mercy. We are so deformed that folk in the church don't remember what, it is, what this church stands for anymore. I'll repeat that. We are so deformed, we are so deformed that folk in the church don't remember what we stand for. Deformed folk. Some say church is boring. Well, church is never boring when you have a spiritual mind. Mm. In fact, nobody can make you bored. Nobody. You make yourself bored because you're boring. Well, see, the devil has already started the deforming process on you. Church is not a candy factory. I said, church is not a candy factory. It's not a candy factory like Willy Wonka. You know the story of Willy Wonka, don't you? The candy factory. Well, chocolate bars with golden tickets will give you access to the Willy Wonka factory. You just want a gumball that lasts forever. You're looking for the candy bar with a golden ticket. Deformed. Church is not Lupa Land. Oh, well, you'll get that tomorrow. Church is not a place where you can get what you want when you want it. A Willy Wonka syndrome. Gumballs don't last forever. Satan will kill your joy when you start looking at other folk. He's trying to deform us any way he can, and he will even try and kill you if God does not intervene. We all must remember how God formed us before we all are deformed. Lord have mercy. Could it be that the reason this church has not grown, or in fact many churches in this conference have not grown, is because of deformity? Deformed. How do I know that churches are deformed? How do I know? Because of lack of brotherly love. I'll repeat that because you didn't get that. Lack of brotherly love. Lack of worship. Lack of fellowship. Lack of love for the truth. That's why I said it. Truth. Sin allowed in the camp. Leaders that don't stand for truth deform churches. Deform congregations. From the top to the bottom. You know how I know if a church is deformed? 
if leadership is not spiritual. That's how I know a church is deformed, when leadership is not spiritual. How can the people be spiritual when they are deformed? But the word of God does not leave us in that horrible state. Hallelujah. God had been so grieved with man's sin during the days of Noah that he was sorry he formed us. Mm. So he made a brand new nation to serve as an example of piety to the rest of the world in an attempt, in an attempt, and here are our next word, in an attempt to reform man. Hallelujah. And when man remained steadfast in his sin and ended up enslaved by their sin, God sent Moses. Who did he send? To deliver them out of the hand of the enemy and Satan. And God gave them the Mosaic law in order to reform man. Mm. God gave man the ten rules to follow that would point him back in the right direction, away from sin and Satan. Hallelujah. He wrote those rules on two tables of stone to reform man and bring him back to his lofty status of dignity and holiness. Well, God didn't fail, did he? God can't fail. He can do anything but fail. Hallelujah. But man failed. He failed to get the message. The very thing God commanded not to do were the very things that man did. Oh, I'm going there. One by one, the Hebrews and the Israelites, God's chosen people, broke every commandment which God had given. Well, then man refused to be reformed. God came up with another plan, hallelujah, another plan for their salvation, which brings us to the fourth main word of the Bible. God sent some powerful prophets. I said God sent some powerful prophets. God sent some powerful prophets. I know you don't like that word, but that's all right. God sent some powerful prophets. Mm. He sent major and minor prophets who left a written record of rules of order for God's universe. Listen to some of them. Are you ready? When Amos, the 8th century sheep herder and keeper of the sycamore trees, left his hills of Tekoa, and walked down in front of the city hall. Where did he walk? Down the city hall and said this, Woe unto them that are eased at Zion. He was informing man that God was tired of their half-hearted religion. When Elijah walked into the palace of Ahab and Jezebel and gave an extended weather forecast, he was just informing them that God was still in charge and until he gave order, there wouldn't be any more rain. Well, when the prophet Micah walked into the court and said, What doeth the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to do justly, to love mercy, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God? He was just informing them that God was fed up with this meaningless meaningless sacrifices and empty ceremonies. And he wanted them to start walking and talking and living their song. God sent this church. I said, this, God sent this church. Oh, you're not with me yet. That's all right. God sent this church. God sent this church. Lord have mercy. Almost afraid to say her name. God sent this church a prophet by the name of Ellen G. White. God gave her a profound message for these last days. I call her the writings, the city map. What do I call it? I call it the city map, hallelujah. The city map, and you know what the Bible is? The Atlas map. And the writings of Ellen G. White are the city map. She talks about the streets and the stop signs and the corners, turn left, turn right, hallelujah. Bridgeport Tabernacle. We need to read her books, like her or not. She was our prophet. Yes, God sent the prophet to inform man for six centuries about just what he wanted us to know. 
But God's plan did not have its desired effect because man failed to hear God. God informed man, and man turned a deaf ear to God. Lord have mercy, Joseph. And the reason man did not hear brings us to our next word of the Bible, conform. Lord have mercy. Instead of being informed, man chose to conform to the standards of this world. Think about it. God's chosen people of a royal priesthood. God's chosen people wanted to be like other deformed folk. Lord have mercy. They wanted to conform civilized folk, peculiar people, three angels message folk, wanted to act like barbarians. Cultured people wanted to act like heathens and dressed like heathens, and they weren't any different than any other church folks. Some of us come from a, a generation of conformers. We conform to, in our choice of entertainment, I told you I was going there today. We conform in our choice of entertainment. We conform in our choice of recreation. Uh, we conform in our choices of dress. We conform in our preaching. We conform in our worship style. We conform in our eating habits. Uh, we conform in our behavior and moral standards. Instead of telling the world how, how to act, we conform to the world. Conform to multitudes. Instead of saying on the, staying on the straight and narrow, so-called Christians are jumping off the straight and narrow. I said folk are jumping off the straight and narrow and jumping on the bo board ride world, road of popularity. They'd rather be popular than follow Jesus. You keep following the multitudes to hell, conforming. It's been how many years has anything changed for better or have we conformed to the world even more? Have mercy. Somebody said worse. So God decided that he was through with the trial and error method. Wait a minute. I said, wait a minute. We have to protect our children from conforming to this world. Oh, I'm going there. You see, there's a new breed of woman. I said, there's a new breed of woman. She is called aggressive. I said, she's called aggressive. These are young girls who prefer young girls. I said, these are girls that prefer young girls. They dress like boys and, in fact, look like boys. In fact, you can't tell the difference between them. Lord have mercy. I was in a barber shop one day getting my hair cut, and I picked up this magazine, a hip-hop magazine. I said, let me check this out, because I saw the caption, Aggressive Women. I said, what's this about? These are young girls that wear white T-shirts. And the story was in New York City, how these women, young girls, wearing their white T-shirts like men and their blue jeans and khakis, aggressive they were called. Wait a minute. There's a new breed of boys. I said there's a new breed of boys who lack respect for elders, who also become lovers of other boys. Oh, you're not with me yet became lovers of other boys. I, you know, I like fashion a little bit. I used to model when I was young. And now I look at the new breed of boys. If you see new magazines now, what are they wearing, gentlemen? They're wearing dresses. And they say they're not gay. They're just wearing dresses. Because it's a new thing. It's a new breed. It's a new breed, deacons. It's a new breed. Lord have mercy. God, who in his uh, omnipotent wisdom formed man, whose heart was broken when Satan deformed man, and because of his deep abiding love offered to reform man, an attempt through the prophets to inform man, and an agonized with the world conforming man, decided to achieve his purpose by using his only begotten son. Hallelujah. And that brings us to our sixth and final word of the Bible, transform. As God the Father and God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, were sitting on heaven's balcony, looking out over the celestial domain, God became utterly disgusted and grieved by the way man turned out. Lord have mercy. So God turned to his son Jesus and said, 
since everything else has failed, I've got to call you. I said, I've got to call on you to go down and transform man. Hallelujah. And restore him to me. And I heard Jesus saying, Father, <laughs> if you prepare me a body, I'll go and carry out your blessed will. And I promise that when I come back, your mission will be accomplished. You know the rest of the story. God prepared a body for Jesus. He implanted a divine sperm into a womb of a virgin named Mary. And one chilly morning in Bethlehem, God presented himself to his redeeming Savior. Jesus came into the world to redeem us from our sins. That's what transformation is all about for 2019. That's what it, is. it means to be transformed because of Jesus. Because of Jesus and his sacrifice, I have been transformed. What Moses and the law could not accomplish, Jesus accomplished. What all the prophets failed to achieve, Jesus achieved it. Transformed by the blood of the Lamb, Bridgeport Tabernacle, we ought not to be like other churches. I'll repeat that. We ought not to be like other churches, deformed, blind, naked, and ugly. We are transformed. Satan had kicked us down, but God has lifted us up. I said Satan has kicked us down, but God has lifted us up. Satan had bound us with sin, but God has restored us. Satan had deformed us, but God has remolded us. Satan has ruined us, but God gave us new hope. Satan plunged us unto sorrow, but God gave us joy. Through the blood, I said through the blood, through the blood, through the blood of his only begotten son, he turned junk into jewels, strangers to God. Once again, uh, we became the children of God. If you want to be transformed, stand up. I say, if you want to be transformed, just stand up. If you want to be transformed, just stand up. If you want to be transformed, just stand up. God gave you, God, God, you are forming me. The devil deformed me. God reformed me. Holy Spirit informed me. Jesus, I can't conform to your ways. Transform me, Lord. Transform me, Lord. Our conference needs to be transformed. Our homes need to be transformed. Our churches need to be transformed. We all need to be transformed. Our pastors need to be transformed. Our elders need to be transformed. Our deacons need to be transformed. Our message, our three angels' message needs to be brought back. Our doctrines, I said it, our doctrines, which is nothing but the voice of God, needs to be put in the forefront. If you knock our church doctrines, you knock the three angels' message, and you knock in the spirit of prophecy, then you need to be transformed. Bridgeport Tabernacle, be ye. I said be ye. Be ye. Be ye. Transformed by the renewing of God. Hallelujah. If you ever need to be transformed, I'm going to ask you to come and meet with me in the front. Transform. If you think you just need to be transformed, meet me in the front. I know I need to be transformed. Hallelujah. I know I need to be transformed. Do you need to be transformed? 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 Just come to the front and be ye transformed. I said, be ye transformed by his word, by his love. He's the only one that can do it. Homeboy can't do it. Homegirl can't do it. Only Jesus can do it. Only Jesus can transform. Pastor, say a word of prayer for us. Come on, create in me. Please don't take your spirit from and restore the joy of salvation so that I may worship thee. Create.
bowed and every eye is closed. Just before prayer, I want to make one last call. You came to the altar to be transformed. We're standing all over the house saying, God, I don't want to be conformed. I, 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 I want to be transformed. But listen, there's somebody here who recognizes that transformation and, and recognizing the need for transformation is one step. Mark 16, 16 says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You're at the altar because you believe. You're standing because you believe. You're saying, I want to be transformed. I don't want to be conformed. I, want, I don't want to be deformed. Uh, that, 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 that you, that's you believing. But he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So somebody is saying, Pastor, I want my transformation to lead to my baptism. I want my transformation to me being washed in the blood of the Lamb. I want my transformation to lead to me joining the church of the living God and living for God for time and for eternity. If that's you, would you just raise your hand towards heaven saying, yes, I want to be transformed, but I want to be baptized into the church of the living God. God bless you. Is there one more person today? I want to be baptized. Is there one more person today? I want to be baptized. Is, where are you? Where, where are you? Would you raise your hand towards heaven and say, God, I, I want to be baptized. I want to be baptized. God, while you're creating in me a clean heart, I want to be baptized. I want to give my everything to you. Would you raise your hand towards heaven if that's you? Would you raise your hand towards heaven? Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Father God, we thank you for the word today. We thank you for Ella Davis. We thank you for his message of hope. We thank you for his message of confrontation and, and a message of rebuke. God, we thank you for forming us. We thank you for forming us. And God, we know that the devil has done his utter best to try to deform us, to jack us up. And God, he has been successful at some times. But we come to the altar saying that we want to be informed, reformed, transformed. God, we don't want to go back the same way that we came in. We don't want to have the same experience like we've been treading water all these years. God, transform us. Please give us a new mind and a new heart. Like David, we come to the altar crying, creating us a clean heart. And renew a right spirit within us. God, you promised that you would take away hearts of stone and replace them with hearts of flesh. You promised that you would do miracles of grace that you would change us God you promise that you would set us free you say that if any man be in Christ he is a new creation all things are done away with and all things have become new and so God we've come today to the altar to claim that promise that the old would be done away with old habits and old characteristics and old behaviors God old desires we pray that all of that would be left at the foot of the cross and we would return to as new creations with new minds and new desires desires, desires for you, desires for Bible study, desires for prayer. God, new characteristics, characteristics of love and grace and forgiveness. God, we pray that we would go back with new habits, uh, habits of righteousness and, and Sabbath keeping and, and worshiping you. God, we want to be new creations. And so we pray that you would transform us into those new creations like a butterfly that has gone into the cocoon. We pray that we would spout wings God and that we would be new creations for you God there is somebody today that raised her hand saying that she wants to be baptized into the church of the living God father I pray that you would forgive her of her sin that you would cleanse her from unrighteousness and that you would seal her decision in glory we know that there is rejoicing in heaven because the Bible says that heaven rejoices over one and so we pray that you would help her to have that same rejoicing in her heart that, that joy bells would be ringing as she goes back home and, and she exclaims that she loves you and she will serve you for time and for eternity. We pray that you would put a hedge of protection round about her so that the devil wouldn't be able to discourage her or pull her back but that her marching orders would be forward ever and backward never. We pray that you would preserve her life, preserve her decision until that point where she jumps into the watery grave of baptism and goes down one person and comes out a new creation. God, we pray that you would bless her on her journey. We pray that you would bless the tithe and the offerings that are about to be received. And God, we pray that you would walk with us not just now, but forever. We pray that you would walk with us until our faith becomes sight and the church militant becomes a church triumphant. We pray that you would redeem us unto yourself. Continue to bless us today. Continue to bless Elder Davis, we pray. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, let everybody that loves him say, amen. Amen. You can return to your seats.